class. I am recording this for you because although you can't see, I am uh, 38 plus weeks pregnant and it's quite possible that I may not be able to meet you for a couple of our face-to-face -face sessions. So to still give us that kind of um, feeling that we are in that face-to-face -face session, that we are discussing things, that we have that somewhat lecture quality, um, and that you don't feel as though all you're doing is reading this semester, especially you know instructions on Blackboard and things of that nature, I've decided to record this video for you um, about what we probably would have talked about in class at this meeting. So this is for Beowulf. Um, this is the text that you should all have. It is Beowulf, the Norton Critical Edition. I chose this one because I really like some of the, the critics. I like the introduction. I like the way that things are broken down, the selections, um, the language, because translations, when you're working with a translation, you are dealing with some different things. But what I'd like to talk to you about today, now that you have read part two and you are ready to start thinking about, um, you know, reading the end of this and, and thinking about your papers and topics and themes, Beowulf is one of the most widely read texts in college um, and just in the, the canon to begin with. It is one of those texts that you probably read in high school. Um, I don't know, you know what exactly you focused on at that point. Maybe it was cultural. Maybe it had something to do with you know, the pitfalls of pride or something of that nature. But as we're looking at Beowulf, I'd like to, to look at it through multiple lenses to just kind of explore this idea of what is its significance um, as far as what we're studying, which is British literature, and it is the beginning of British literature. And then in addition to, you know, what is its significance as far as British literature is concerned, I also want to think about, you know, why are we still reading it? Um, why do high schoolers read it? You know, why is it on every college syllabus, you know, for some, for some kind of course that's a survey of something? So I'm going to offer you a couple different perspectives during this video. We're going to talk about the historical perspective and how people have read it and how it has been interpreted in media as well. We're going to talk about where the newest version of Beowulf, the one with Angelina Jolie playing Grendel's mother, which was rather controversial when that came out. People, you know, were all upset that Hollywood was sexing things up and, um, and they're ch changing too much of it. But to be quite honest with you, if we really look at the historical roots of where this has come from, you might come to find that Hollywood did less damage than we all think they did. Um, so that's something that we're going to talk about, too. So we're going to talk about its historical roots. We're going to talk about how it's been portrayed by media. We're going to talk about its cultural roots. Um, we're going to talk about its psychological impact and as it fits into these various categories of a heroic epic or an elegic epic um, and just how it portrays the human condition in general. So let's start out by talking about the human condition. Um, this may or may not be a term that you're familiar with, so I'm going to start out by just explaining what it is. It's really very simple. <laughs> it's a whole lot like what it sounds. Um, it is essentially the elements that make us human. And when we study literature or when we study something um, that reflects the plight of man, we often hear this language of the human condition because there are certain things that regardless of location, um, you know, geographically, regardless of race, regardless of age, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of where one was born, you know, in the, the whole scheme of time, there are things that don't change that just uh, some of them, you know, in a sense, plague us as humans. Um, and, and some of them are, are good things that, that we experience as part of this, this group of humanity. So when we're talking about the human condition, one of the things that stands out most um, that is unique about being human and about how humanity has dealt with this topic across ages is the idea that we are mortal. And so whether you believe that there's an afterlife or you don't believe that there's an afterlife, there is that conflict that here we are in this world. Um, we don't know when it gets to end for us, but we know that everyone does have an ending point, 
whether it's old age or something else, you know, that, that constant awareness that we are not here forever drives us. And it motivates people in different ways. You have people who then take a, a religious background and, you know, they're just striving for the afterlife. You have people like those in Beowulf, which although there's a whole lot of talk about God and the almighty creator um, and all of that stuff, Beowulf was not created, I could say the oral text was not created by people who believed in the Judeo-Christian God that is reflected in the written text. And so when you're looking at this quest for fame and this desire to leave behind some kind of legacy and this, this true awareness of, you know, I might die and that's totally fine as long as I die in glory. And when I die, that I'm recognized in some way, whether it's as um, a, a monument, which is eventually built for Beowulf, um, or whether it's through the shops who are the storytellers, which is how we get Beowulf. And there is a scene in the text where a, um, a shop does show up. By the way, shop is spelled S-C-O-P. So you, you will see that, or sometimes it's called a bard. A bard sang. Um, a shop was a storyteller. They were professionals. They traveled. And their job was to immortalize those individuals who were worth immortalizing because of their loyalty, because of their brave feats, uh, because of something culturally that made them significant. And so... This, this text, Beowulf, is, um, is largely a, a story that is a, a legacy. It's, it was someone worth remembering. I mean, that's essentially what we know about Beowulf. He was told this story orally um, throughout ages before it was ever written down by the most likely Judeo-Christian individual who then recorded it. And, uh, and clearly superimposed things on it that have to do more with the values of the, the people who came after. And those people who came after are the ones who had the ability to write. And those who have the ability to write have the ability to, um, to pass on their perspective and their version of things. But it's still very clear, if we read in between the lines, that the original people who Beowulf is talking about, uh, they didn't subscribe to those same things. So let's start there. Let's start with the history of Beowulf. And I'm not going to have you read a ton of critics um, for this course. This is just a survey course. It's not a majors course. I would love if you just fell in love with the text and with literary analysis and all of that and, and you wanted to pursue majors courses, then you're going to get a lot more in depth with the literary criticisms and, um, and where it falls in the, the canon of literature and things of that nature. But for us, we're just kind of doing a survey of what is the significance of this text and how does it relate to us, why are people still reading it, and those kinds of things. So let's talk about historically. Historically, and there's been a great deal of research, actually one of our former professors who has retired, but his name was Frank Battaglia, contributed greatly to this study of what we call matrilineal society. And so um, Professor Battaglia, who again was very published, really contributed to this, this understanding of early Celtic and Anglo-Saxon literature, he put together um, quite a, a thorough observation about the, the significance of the women in the text. Um, it's not a text that people usually say is about women. When you think about Beowulf, you think about gore, you think about the brotherhood, you think about guys drinking together and partying together and then dying together, right, and avenging one another. Um, that's essentially what you think about when you think of Beowulf. But really, there are some interesting underlying things going on about the significance of women. And you do have Welthow, who is um, King Hrothgar's bride, which, oddly enough, um, she has quite a bit to say. When Beowulf shows up, she not only um, welcomes him, which, you know, typical of a hostess, but in addition to welcoming him, and uh, she, she kind of chides Hrothgar a little bit when he decides to turn over, you know, the whole, like, kingship 
to Beowulf. He says, I'm going to adopt you as my son. And she's like, whoa, you know, hold on a second. What about my kids um, and and their lineage? And is he going to take care of our nephews? And, you know, you're you're being a little rash here. And she also warns against pride and she warns against evils and things of that nature. So she has a much more significant role than just the hostess who is serving everyone, which, to be honest, she doesn't really do. Um, so what is her role, right? Then you have Grendel's mother. And Grendel's mother um, is a different kind of woman, but she is a female character. And she's a female character who takes on the revenge of her son um, in a more gruesome way than he attacked initially. And so you have these two powerful women in this story. So to give just a little bit of this historical context and and to, to kind of nod towards, you know, where was Hollywood going with the Angelina Jolie character as Beowulf's mom? And, and um, I'm sorry, not Beowulf's mom, as Grendel's mother and, and that whole line. Um, we need to talk about this idea of matrilineal society. So the Germanic warriors were not the first settlers, of course, of um, of what would have been Britain at this time. They were marauders of fortune. They traveled, um, and what they did was they raided. <laughs> that's, that's that's basically what they did. They traveled. They raided. They drank. They had a great time, but their goal was to win fame, was to win glory, was to win stuff. You're going to keep seeing that language of the ring giver. And when you get um, a description of a good king, it has very little to do with any kindnesses or, um, or qualities of that nature. A good king is one who endows his men with stuff. He is generous. That's really the, the, the only quality that we see of a good king. He is generous. Um, and he is called this ring giver. And the relationship that the soldiers or that the, the warriors had with their king was, uh, it was a pledge of allegiance. It was all right, you know, we're going to fight with you. We're going to fight for you. We're going to support your legacy and your reign in a sense. Um, and your job for us is to let us share in the spoils of anything that we come across, to keep us fed, um, to keep us sheltered, and, you know, that was essentially it. It was a good deal. So they got to travel. They got to get stuff. And um, and they had a great time doing it. So that's that's part of what's going on here is this, you do see this brotherhood. And it is a very strong male bond. When Hrothgar's um, closest advisor, when his friend is killed, when... Um, when Grendel's mom shows up and she goes after the friend, that's where we see the greatest reaction from Hrothgar. I mean, here you've had, he has been losing men um, for 12 years. Although some some people will have you believe that this happened every night for 12 years and everyone's like, oh, well then how are there still people to eat and to kill? That's really you know hard to believe and far too mythological. Um, but that's not really the case. It was that this place, this place Herod, that he had built as a monument to his greatness and to the, you know, his men's loyalty and their um, their skill as warriors that nobody could touch them. And they had this beautiful hall to show for it. The idea was that that hall was useless because that's where Grendel would visit. So if you notice, Hrothgar has to leave the hall at night. He retires to his bed with his wife. Um, and the other men generally do, too. We, we get this language that it was empty. Um, and that's really where that comes from, that, that horror with Grendel interrupting this band of brothers that... You know, they couldn't have a good time because you've got this monster lurking around just waiting to eat people. Um, and so that put quite a damper on what they were hoping to accomplish in this, this space. So you get the greatest reaction out of him when his best friend is killed. Um, for those of you who have read the Iliad or the Odyssey, um, that should remind you of the... 
um, the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus and why Achilles re-enters the war, you have that same kind of thing going on. Hrothgar is so personally violated because his best friend, his closest advisor, is the one who's been targeted. And now it is, now it's personal. Now he is going to say to Beowulf, you need to fix this. Like, what can you do? We will give you everything within our power. I will, you know, give you anything that, that I have, my entire kingdom. Like, I'll give you anything. You need to exact revenge. And there's this language that pops up of a man price. Because that's essentially how, um, how the law worked. If someone killed someone, then you had to be able to exact a man price. You had to get some type of um, of retribution. And the problem with Grendel was that he had killed all of these people and it was an embarrassment to Hrothgar and his men that they had not exacted any man prices. They had not gotten the bodies back. They hadn't had proper burials. This was disgraceful. And so that's what they're up against. It's a pride thing. So that's the Germanic warriors. And they again, were not the original people to be living in this location. They came as marauders of fortune um, and they pillaged. Now the first people who were there, or the first people that we know of who were there, um, were the Celtic group. And the, the Celtic group actually had a matrilineal society as opposed to what you can clearly see as a patrilineal society going on with um, with Rockar and his men, where it's you know man dominated. I mean, even Grendel is described as you know uh, the descendant of Cain. Like the worst possible thing you could do is kill your brother, right? But here you have um, here you have a, a different society, and matrilineal means that the line of kingship actually comes from the woman, and the woman holds a great deal of power. And what they had was a specific woman. Um, it was it was a pagan society, and they had locations where people would go um, to have. How do I explain this? It was like a public copulation ceremony, where the the strongest female would clearly indicate that she had chosen a man to rule on the throne, and until she chose someone else, that man was secure in his place. But it was very, very much because of the influence of the woman who did the choosing. So this is the society that this is coming from. So when you look at uh, the problem that the, the Germanic warriors have with Grendel's mother and with Grendel, there's no father figure. Um, it's just a mama and her mama's boy, and she is a clearly powerful woman, um, and she's a sea beast, right? So that in itself is a whole different area of fear of the unknown, um, and we'll talk about that when, when Beowulf gets to the edge of the waters, and he starts seeing all the beasts swim around, and, you know, everybody's terrified, and he's the one who says, you know, I just have to take the plunge. And he literally takes a plunge into the water um, to fight this unknown beast. But you do have uh, this, this kind of tension of this very brotherly society who are taking over this matrilineal society, and they are displacing women. Um, and so... That's something that you see going on in Beowulf, kind of under the surface, and this is something that uh, that Frank Battaglia, Dr. Battaglia, wrote a great deal about, um, and you can read more about that if you'd like. I'll have links, you know, on, on Blackboard to some of the articles and things of that nature, but I want you to just start to see a little bit of the historical context here, and that you've got... This one group who have their, their shops and their storytellers, right, who are now going to rewrite the history that came before to validate it. So they're going to validate their new kind of world of matrilin uh, I'm sorry, of patrilineal society, of this brotherhood, by monstracizing what came before, which was um, these, these men who are so connected with their women, 
um, that that's how they they gain kingship. And so they're they're going to undercut that. They're going to make that look really bad and monstrous. You know, where's the father? And he's a descendant of Cain. Worst possible thing. And then you kind of have a similar thing happening because you've got you've got three historical um, overlays going on. So you've got the retelling of the matrilineal society. Let's monstrosize them, right? Then you have the um, the Germanic warriors who were marauders of fortune. That was it. And then you have the Christian authors who come in and said, um, okay, well, we like this story. It's part of our culture, but we need to change a few things. You know, Beowulf is a great character. He is admirable, but he needs to worship God, the Judeo-Christian God. And so you do have this other thing going on where there's a lot of mention of fate and fate would have been a very pagan concept, but then there's also a lot of mention of when the Almighty decides it's your time, it's your time, and that kind of language of, of predestination based on the will of the Judeo-Christian God. Um, and they're, they're, of course, retelling this as well and trying to put a spin on things that points to, you know, um, to, to God. You can see very clearly when Beowulf defeats Grendel's mother, and we can take a look at it just for a moment. I want you to to notice what goes on here. But when Beowulf defeats Grendel's mother, and we are looking at in our books, it is just around line. 1570. That's just about where we are. Um, and you have this moment. This is the moment where, you know, he's been allowed to handle this crazy sword, right? And it it cuts Grendel's mother. She's she's done. And it says, a light appeared and the place brightened the way the sky does when heaven's candle is shining clearly. And um, And of course, that invocation of heaven's light entering this previously dark, dark place is this idea that the only reason that Beowulf won was because he had the blessing of the Judeo-Christian God. It's not just a story about Beowulf's strength. It's a story about, um, about being blessed as well. So that's the historical context. Then, as we move from the historical context, you do have, like I said, you, you've got, is this a heroic poem? Um, is this, a, it's been called an elegy. An elegy is a mourning of something. It's the end of something. Um, is this the end of a heroic tradition? Or is this the end of this kind of pagan brotherhood? Like, what exactly is the poet mourning? Um, you can see very clearly later on when Beowulf is in need of his men, and even though he tells them, you know, don't worry, I'm fine. I'm going to take care of this. You guys stay on the hill. When they fail to come to his rescue, when his helmet is on fire and his head is still in it, you start to think, you know, this, this isn't going to work out. These people are really starting to look out for themselves. Even the whole concept of how the dragon gets awoken. Um, why is he awoken? He's awoken because a guy goes into his horde, which, you know, the idea of hoarding isn't um, in line with the idea of gift giving. It's very much the opposite, that greed versus that generosity. So the dragon is set up, obviously, as, a, as an enemy, you know, of their values. But he wasn't bothering anybody. But one of Beowulf's men goes into the dragon's lair, steals something for himself, awakens this beast, and now the entire community has to deal with it because this beast is now just, you know, setting everything on fire that he can see. And then eventually their king has to die because of it. And so you do have that elegic tone of um, there's that, that, that death of the good guy. Like where, where is the guy who's going to look out for everybody, who's going to be brave in the face of these moments? Um, he doesn't exist anymore because it kind of dies with, with Beowulf. Even though one of his men comes to his aid, um, 
he chooses to do something very different with the uh, all of the stuff than than Beowulf would have done. And I don't want to, you know, in a course like this, I don't really believe in spoilers um, because we are looking at the text as a whole, even though I'm having you read it in segments. I want you to be thinking about the big picture the whole time. Um, so if I if I give away parts of it, I'm sorry, but reading a, a, a text like this, it really is more about the experience of reading it and the, the poet's description of things um, than it is, you know, sitting on the edge of your seat, like, what's going to happen? Because let's be honest, it's all incredibly predictable what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. Um, the good guy is going to, you know, fight until his old age and then something's going to kill him. I mean, that's just essentially what happens in these stories. Um, there's There's nothing that's edge of your seat about what's going on in Beowulf. So what, you know, what drives people to still read it? Well, you do have that, that elegy. You have that mourning of something um, that was profoundly important to the people and the, the storyteller immortalizing this experience of this one wonderful individual is important. You also have just amazing, um, strength of man right you've got this good versus evil thing going on where from the the darkest of places you know Grendel Grendel's mom the dragon you've got this guy who in the face of absolute danger and uncertainty just kind of says I'm gonna go for it because I can and because survival is important to me and because loyalty is important to me and because, you know, I want to show off the great strength that I have as a man. Man doesn't have to succumb to all of these these things. Um, you know, I love the description when Unferth, you know, the guy in Hrothgar's band, who really gives Beowulf the hardest time before Grendel, because, you know, Beowulf shows up and these guys haven't been able to do anything. And they are considered a really good band of warriors. Um, they've got Herod, you know, they've got a lot to show for it, but they, they haven't been able to defeat this guy. And then, you know, this dude gets off a boat and announces himself as the one who's going to solve it all. And some people, you know, are a little suspect. And you've got Unferth who enters and he says, hey, aren't you the guy who lost the swimming match with Brekka? Why should we trust you? You can't even win a swimming match. Um, and, and Beowulf comes right back at him with, you know, I would have won the swimming match. I was doing just fine, but I was attacked by sea monsters, right? And you've got this story about Beowulf out in the middle of the ocean already doing something really pretty stupid, but also pretty amazing um, for a, a person to be doing, you know, to, to have this crazy swimming match that lasted for days, right? But then he also beats sea monsters, and even though he doesn't win the match, he obviously comes out as more courageous and as the um, the better contender because he finished the race having to beat sea monsters. Um, and so you, you do have just this glorification of the strength of man. You know, um, Beowulf fights Grendel the first time with his bare hands. He says, you know, I'm not even going to use a weapon because this is what God gave me and this is how I'm taking him down. Um, it should be slightly reminiscent of like a David and Goliath, right? Where the king tries to get David to put on all that armor and it just weighs him down. And he says, you know what? I'm not going to do it your way because I know that my strength comes from the Lord. And I'm going to use this little, you know, slingshot with a stone and I'm taking him out. Not because that's the best weapon of choice, just because I have been ordained to do this and I am going to defeat this evil. That's what you've got going on with Beowulf. Beowulf says, I'm not taking your swords. I'm not taking all your stuff. I'm going to fight him with my bare hands because that's the way he's going down. That's the way I fought the sea monsters. Um, and I have complete faith that I am the one to end this for you. And so he goes into that fight, and he does. He defeats Brundle with his bare hands. And it's such um, a physical fight that not only, excuse me, I know it's just a little bit itchy. Um, it's such a physical fight that not only does he defeat him with his bare hands, but they practically wreck Herod in the process. They're, like, getting thrown against walls. 
walls. Like this place is destroyed that we're told it was shaking so badly. If it hadn't been made so well, it probably would have just crashed down. Um, and so you, you get that like, wow factor with Beowulf. You know, here's this guy who came in and in the face of evil, he did it. Um, and then when he fights Grendel's mother, you get a whole nother layer of being amazed at the plight of man and at the strength of man, because now, you know, Herod wasn't his territory. It was, you know, he's he is from a foreign land, so Beowulf is always, minus the dragon, he's always fighting outside of his comfort zone, right? He's fighting in this, this other place. But there's something to be said, like, men are comfortable on land. You then go put someone in the water and say, you know, this is your new battleground. Um, that's scary. That's a problem. And Beowulf is the only one who's willing to do it. You know, Unferth very clearly after he's Beowulf has gained his um, his respect, Unferth gives him his sword, hunting, and he says, "You're braver than I am." I mean, that's essentially what he says. I won't do that. That is really scary. Um, but Beowulf is just—he's got that drive. He wants fame, and he he says, "You know, I might die trying, but I'm going to do it." Somebody's got to do it. I'm going to step up. I'm going to do it. And um, and you can see that there isn't a whole lot of faith in him, even though he's proven himself with Grendel. When they get to that bubbling water and when they start to see those sea monsters popping up and when they just see the, the quality of the mire that he's about to go into, they lose faith really quickly. They don't hang around. When Beowulf finishes that fight, he comes out and everybody's gone home because they didn't think he could do it. And so again, you've got that like, yes, you know, man wins. Man is strong in the face of adversity. He can come back. He's powerful. And you have that, that wonderful celebration of man. The other thing that you have going on here is kind of psychological. And that is, um, and this was something that J.R. Tolkien had, had pointed out in his text that is called, it's in your book, don't necessarily recommend that you read it, it's a little dense, um, but it's called The Monsters and the Critics, and it is, it's, like I said, it's, it's dense. Um, I have a couple things highlighted that I will share with you, but it is, um, it's a lot to get through. I would, however, recommend that you read the introduction because I think the introduction to this book is uh, fairly accessible and it does give you a, a pretty good overview for some of these, these contexts that we're talking about. But you have this, um, you know, one of the things that I have highlighted here on page 117, right in the middle of Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, as J.R. Tolkien is discussing the significance of this text, and this just kind of goes into what we were previously talking about, he says one of the most potent elements in the fusion is the northern courage and this theory of courage. And that's clearly what we see as, um, as why Beowulf is this heroic individual. And at the same time, just to talk about the elegy and this human condition, right, he says on page one. 15, and I really like this part as well. Um, he's talking about the idea of being a hero, and he says, Beowulf is not then the hero of a heroic lay, precisely. He has no enmeshed loyalties nor hapless love. So in the, the string of what would be considered heroic, like the romantic heroic things, um, there's nothing like that. Beowulf is, is pretty much a loner seeking fame. I mean, that's really what he is. Um, but here is the language that J.R. Tolkien uses that I really like. He says, he is a man, and that for him, and many, is sufficient tragedy. Um, the idea that man has a limit, that he, will, that he will die, that everything he faces is with great uncertainty. And that's where I'd like to go now in talking about the psychological aspect of, of Beowulf. One of the critics, um, J.R. Tolkien included in this group, has suggested that um, this story is really a story about fear, 
not necessarily about overcoming your fear, but just about the embodiment of fear and how fear is, um, for man, comes about. So if we're looking at this idea of manifestations of fear, and this is kind of out of the the introduction, and I, I really like what he does in the introduction. Um, and he talks about how there are three struggles. This is on page, um, well, it's, it's 25, you know, in Roman numerals because we're looking at the introduction. But he talks about how W.B. Yeats would have called these things uh, phantasmagoria, right? Don't worry about that word. But the idea is that there are these struggles. So three struggles in which the pre-natural force for evil of the hero's enemies comes springing at him in demonic shapes. You have three encounters with what the critical literature and the textbook glossaries have called monsters in three archetypal sites of fear. The barricaded night house, the infested underwater current, and the reptile haunted rocks of a wilderness. So if we think of the poem in this way, its place in the world of art becomes clearer and more secure because you have, um, you have these representations of things that man is afraid of. The barricaded night house, you know, this, this kind of haunted space um, that is so vulnerable. The, the shark or monster infested waters right? This idea of the fear of the unknown, of plunging into something that you have no idea what you're going to find. And then that reptile lurking mountains. These are the spaces that man is uncomfortable in. And so when we're reading Beowulf, I want you to think about how it also plays off this manifestations of fear. And how is it just a psychological treatise of what, um, what man is is dealing with the human condition, essentially. I mean, what he deals with on a regular basis. Um, what are the fears that he has to face and how do these versions of those fears relate to us still? And again, um, this idea that we're still reading this for a reason. So that is what I want to talk to you about today, um, just to give you this these contexts for how to approach Beowulf, how to read Beowulf, how to write about Beowulf. Because in your online space, you are writing about a text. And that is different than what you've done in the past, which if you've come from English 111 or English 151, um, you have not really done literature. You've been writing about essays, about concepts. And feel free to still approach this thematically. Um, you can write about the theme of fear or the theme of courage or um, the theme of brotherhood, of loyalty. All of those are wonderful themes to write about within the text. Um, but I also want you to, to just kind of think about this broader context of, okay, how does that theme fit into one of these contexts that we're studying that is, is going to be significant in our study of, of British literature? Um, you just start to get the smallest glimmer of corruption when we have that one guy who invades the uh, the dragon's lair and brings down all of this horror to his his community because of his actions. Um, and you do begin that that corruption that then Chaucer takes to a whole new level in Canterbury Tales because um, man is so corrupt by the time we get to that point. I mean, we still have serious corruption. We know that Unferth um, has been disgraced because he is a brother killer or a kin killer. Um, he somehow killed someone within his own clan. The assumption is that he has paid the man price for it because there isn't like this huge stigma following him. He hasn't been, you know, ousted. But clearly um, there's something underlying there that is disgraceful about him. And Beowulf has no problem throwing that in his face when Unferth says, you know, hey, didn't you like not finish the swimming match with Brekka? You get that clash of egos um, of kind of saying, well, didn't you kill your own kin? Like, let's not go there. You're not the first person who should be pointing fingers. 
So as we're as we're looking at this, you know, I, I would like you to think about modern translations. As I was saying, the Angelina Jolie character, um, she kind of fits that matrilineal, powerful woman who uses sex as a way to not just seduce men. I mean, that's the way that the the film portrays it, um, but as a way to confer power, to empower men um, through her sexuality. That whole concept is very matrilineal. You know, you don't see that in patrilineal society that women empower men because of their, you know, their sex appeal and, and their um, their willingness to, to have sex with them, right? They're they're choosing them. Um, you don't see that so much. Although you, as we as we continue in our studies, it does kind of come back in pieces about uh, the role of women and that power. But it's certainly something that the makers of Beowulf kind of picked up on uh, in the historical study. And even in that film, if you've watched it, you see the the beginning of the Christian Crusaders kind of coming in and setting things on fire, changing pagan things. If you've not seen the film, I encourage you to see the film. I'm sure you can get it on Netflix or something like that, Amazon Prime. I'm sure it's not hard to find. Um, but it really is, it's, it's a good just look at how Hollywood has taken all of these different contexts and put them together to try to give a bigger picture of what this story is. Now, trust me, they've made some really stupid decisions too. I do not like how Hrothgar commits suicide in it. There's some really stupid ideas. The idea that the dragon is like Beowulf's son, stupid ideas. Um, but there's also some good stuff going on that I think is, is worth looking at. And you know, being analytical, which is one of the things that we are striving to do here, just has to do with being willing to um, to critique something, to evaluate it, to take it apart, and to look at its pieces. So I can say that this was good about the film, and I appreciated how that part was treated. And I can also say, you know, they made some really stupid decisions, <laughs> and that is part of, of being a critic. Um, so feel free to reach out to me. I have recorded... A couple of these because I don't know if I'll need them um, but I will keep you all posted and I wish us a wonderful semester and I am excited to see all of you and to